All right. Well, why don't we why don't we get going? Welcome, 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 everyone. Uh, welcome to Reimagine the Town Hall. Uh, I am Paul Lewis, president of the Architectural League, and Reimagine is a unique gathering of 119 graduates from the class of 2020, representing 44 different design schools across the country. And over the past three weeks, these graduates in groups of about six have met once a week. Um, roughly to discuss questions and ideas about how they might reimagine their role as designers and thinkers relative to the converging crises of COVID, climate change, radical economic inequity, pervasive racism, and racist violence. So tonight, tonight is an opportunity to give a platform, to give a voice uh, to these participants, to present aspects of those conversations in short three minute videos. Uh, these are, and it should be stated, these are initial ideas. They are not conclusions. They're catalysts for further development. They ask what if questions. They are uh, you know, tentative propositions for new paradigms, for provisional manifestos for action. They are ideas for reimagining uh, the agency of the architect and the designer uh, and the agency uh, of this next generation of designers and architects. Um, so as for the format for, to, uh, for tonight, we will have four segments uh, in which uh, we will present the videos of five groups. Uh, there are a total of 20 uh, groups and they're labeled or lettered arbitrarily uh, from group A to group T. Um, and then uh, those videos will then be followed by a short uh, Q&A session where each of the coordinators will pose a single question for their group to answer. Uh, we, have, we have many more people assembled than time permits for everyone to speak. Uh, so you are all encouraged to add comments, responses, ideas uh, in the chat. Uh, and with a v, uh, VP debate at nine o'clock, we, we have to move swiftly. So my thanks go out to Rosalie Ginevro, and Rieselbach, Katarina Flaxman, and Nanase Shirakawa of the Architectural League for their invaluable assistance in making this happen. And my specific thanks go to the 30 different coordinators uh, slash advisors who are academics and practitioners from across the country that willingly gave their time and creativity to foster the dialogue and discussions in each group. Simply put, this was an amazing contribution from you all. So thank you all, thank you all so much. And thanks specifically to Lynn Rice and Stella Betts who along with many of the coordinators helped collectively frame this program over the past few months. But mostly thanks to the participants of the class of 2020, whose creative engagement and ideas drive this event. So without further delay, let us all hear what they have to say. So let's go ahead and begin the first uh, collection of videos. Six aliens from Alpha Centauri system are vacationing on Earth when they are stranded by a global pandemic. At a roundtable discussion and in an attempt to understand their new home, they construct a diagram. At the center is the now with past and future radiating outward and forming the scale with which they assess the built environment. Their analysis leads to unexpected revelations. From empty pizza boxes to Amazon cartons, cities are really struggling to keep up with the overflowing refuse of this stay-at-home era. I wonder if we can help them do anything about it? Such a culture shock. They label things recyclable, but they don't get recycled in the end. They used to ship it all to China, but China got smarter. They produced so much trash that at some point, there was a trash barge floating around at sea for two months because no one wanted to deal with it. That's just a municipal solid waste. The amount of waste from construction and demolition is at least twice as much. What if construction and demolition waste is banned from landfill? I guess they'll start making houses out of their own waste. They're already crushing up and burning every piece of material they don't know what to do with. What if unbuilding replaces demolishing? Why don't they take buildings apart to be reused instead of bulldozing everything then? Didn't they already think of that 10 years ago? This pavilion was made up of urban furniture that ultimately disseminated throughout the city. So it's like community-owned furniture. They do have techniques to make disassembly friendly buildings. What if the deconstruction of buildings is celebrated as much as their construction? 
Oh, yes, I came here a bit earlier than you guys and got to take part in a super fun art project they put up. A group got together to paint the brick facade gold before it was taken down. The bricks ended up in community landscaping around the city. You can see traces of that every time you pass by. Oh, yeah, there's a place where they take apart a building every 20 years in order to rebuild the sacred place and pass on building traditions. But these days, they construct their buildings out of materials beyond wood as well, and some of which are really nasty stuff. What if there's a corporate take-back system in place? What if manufacturers eliminate toxic materials from their pipeline because they're now responsible for their products end of life? Right? I think right before the pandemic, there was a protest where people would pile up all the designed to be obsolete toxic stuff outside the corporate offices. Ah. Huh. Perhaps if more of their buildings cleverly incorporate off-the-shelf components like that in-house, they could be taken back to the producer to be remanufactured. It was certainly a new iteration. That's true. They could stand to upgrade their buildings to use less operational energy in the process as well. What if instead of starting over every time, they design the maintenance and retrofit of buildings with as much enthusiasm as they do ground-up construction? During the pandemic, so many offices have become ghost buildings, they can reimagine them as housing or find other ways to repurpose them. So many of them are just glass boxes that rely on air conditioning. They could be retrofitted using passive heating and cooling methods that are appropriate for the region. What if building audits are implemented every so often and environmentally conscious retrofits become a requirement? In order to do that, they would need to truly take stock of their buildings. A corner piece of curved glass has fewer reuse cases than a rect regular rectangular piece. Right? Their post occupancy reviews should include equity and access issues besides building forms. This is starting to sound like the role of their architects is not just designing buildings. Yeah. Yeah. What if we resist the idea that architecture is a building? What if sustainability is a right and not a premium? What if we stop trying to build ourselves out of ecological collapse? And what if we move towards degrowth rather than growth? Temperature readings are taken consistently from a variety of collection points all over the world. These points exist in gridded zones that divide the earth into digestible and calibrated units of measure. Different agencies use different scales of grids, allowing for cross-referencing of data sets. The smaller the grid, the higher the fidelity to the actual temperature of the place. These measurements contribute to an average overall reading, and any anomaly temperatures allow for an evaluation of how temperature is changing over time. A delta of 1.5 degrees Celsius is equal to an average temperature increase of 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, which is equal to the tripling of the 354 major cities with summertime temperatures above 95 degrees which equals about four inches of average global sea level rise, or the liquid in a glass of water. Therefore, temperature is averaged, reduced, compared to figments of memory and events past. Like the last time there were five plus tropical storms in Atlantic Basin, in 1971. Warming is often conveyed as global, detached from the smaller units specific to the place. The whole world isn't equally saturated with collection stations. The Arctic, for example, lacks the density that, say, the Mediterranean has. Data suggests its warming is more than twice as fast as global average. Essentially, these readings from all over the globe become units in a much larger, aggregated system that determines a global average temperature. But to most, this global average increase, this warming that is constantly quantified, exists as just a number. At current emission rates, the world will pass. 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming by the year 2040. But what does that really mean? We require translation from the abstract to the concrete, from intangible numbers to all familiar phenomena, in which we register how we dictate temperature daily until maybe it will dictate us. Before, t before 2020, you might have felt a little bit more secure about like the trajectory of 
how you're living and housing and anything, right? And I, mean, I, I see it personally in my in my neighborhood where they put a homeless shelter down the block from my house, and uh, people after after they were already settled in, all the homeowners were protesting about how it should be it should be somewhere else. I think it's something that I found was a big change from coming from India to New York was how people talked about climate. In India, for the first five years of my education, I, it was super climate oriented. So after coming here, it was a different kind of conversation where climate was taken something as more like a discussion to be talked about. I think something that architects have been very focused on, which is the whole idea of work from home, right? But when you think about that, it really is just one type of working from home you know we've got a statistical average for housing you know like what data is analyzed who does it represent the whole the whole um discussion is is a mess which is our mirror right Affordable housing, housing would fall into Income social inequality class. racial inequality what does the ability to work remotely look like manifest as an architectural space is it like having these many rooms or disaster with housing you have to talk about the idea of like rebuilding because people protest against um gentrification but i feel like you're not aware until it's too late what are the trajectories toward um ameliorating those problems an architect can demand that they choose someone to build a project if they've, they've basically convey that they pay fair wages. How active are we as citizens and how can we start to rethink who is at the table in an architecture practice? We sort of adaptive and adapt and reuse. We map that and then we can see how that architecture differs in different social groups, like what kind of architectural access do different social groups have. Um, an architect could demand that they specify uh, the certain of types of materials. Costs right? being like 30% of someone's income. Um, we sort of like start from that because that's the legal requirement and then work their way back into how much building can we afford and it It's to also an internal issue where you yourself have to change, you yourself have to be more involved into what's going on. It's not just them. I think that essentially what we're looking at is equity in architecture. And we're kind of bringing in different perspectives on it. I think part of what makes architecture exciting is the like individuality and the like creativity that each person brings to it. And like, that's part of school is honing that design ability, right? So if we then took out the value of that, like what is architecture look like? And then Adina just brought up the Sharon Sutton quote, which basically talks about a rethinking of the architectural education model so that it's not hero based and it's a little bit more run like a nursing program where there's a little bit more of a focus on service and collaboration and um, there's a, a buildup of trust. I mean, I think that's one that's tied into that same sort of issue. Like having architecture collaborate with other subjects. So having like different schools share resources or share subjects and classes where you can like take classes in another, in another school. And the one thing I would say to also like kind of point about sharing amongst schools is also sharing amongst disciplines and outcomes too, is like, you know, at the end of the day, uh, like, you know, just like a high powered PC can do a lot of different things. Also, 3D printers are used for a number of things. You know, you can have chemistry labs that want to have kind of like 3D printers and zoomed cutters. And I think that there's a really high potential to think about kind of how students amongst dis different disciplines or kind of just in different pathways towards their ultimate education goals. Design can really positively affect the built environment right now that we have no way of both monetizing, but also even just coming up with some type of pipeline to like actually get 
young designers to intervene in their communities and have ways to make that better. We don't have a government right now that's going to say, let's pay a bunch of like young design students to make our schools safe. If we're going to talk about this big idea about access and equity, um, where does it begin? I do think it has to do with having more people at the, like more diverse voices at the table. Like we should be learning about redlining because those are integral to understanding how we practice architecture. Like, like I'm sure there's racism even written within zoning. Like there's all these layers that we have to what, unlearn, right? But you need to know what to unlearn. Um, if we're talking about aesthetics, then um, that goes to history. And that means introducing different historical perspectives and different cultures and materials. And I wonder if um, primary education and what happens before one reaches undergrad program is one very effective way to rethink the discipline. How to think creatively just in general within our own uh, schools. And that kind of also has to do with not only the programs that schools can provide, but also just the spatial qualities itself. I do think that a lot of people decoupled formal considerations from social causes, social goods, kind of, and like larger projects about kind of like what utilities are. And so much of our design careers were decoupled from some like very material present concerns in the service of saying it's much easier to not worry about all of these things. We assume that architecture can solve a lot of the things that we cope with, so we insert it to solve those problems. But yeah. maybe it needs to go alongside greater issues that we then advocate and stand for. What if the architecture education system was divorced from the profession? Institutions were responsible for teaching design thinking, and professional mentors were responsible for teaching technique skills in practice. What if different paths of specialized architecture education were created, with some paths focused on creating buildings and others focused on alternative methods of architectural practice? What if architects address and reduce the 40% of the world's carbon emissions that the building and the construction industries are responsible for? What if the disconnection associated with online classes became an opportunity to network with classmates around the world? What if schedules disappeared? We didn't expect immediate responses. What if future architects' role was no longer about joint creative new buildings, but about the art and the process of design? What if we hybridize the curriculum using open access platforms such as massive open online courses and massive multiplayer online games? What if education wasn't taught in the classroom? What if game? The game that allowed us to collect knowledge and communicate with others in a complete system. What if playing models? By playing, we learn architecture space in the game. What if AR classrooms, virus gamification tools could be used together for everyone to display their design with fun, give feedback globally, and cover others' weaknesses? What if community-driven, we talked to our neighborhoods and we reached out to others to learn from one another outside of school settings? What if mobile, the schools were able to move so that people could learn and observe from new settings? What if everywhere, every space was prepared and treated as a learning opportunity? What if education was human? How to become humans? How would this be reflected in our architecture? What if start from square one? The best option for reimagining the education system was to restart from square one. What if 
Education was like architecture. So why don't we have the groups A, B, C, D, and E turn on their videos, and we can have a, a, rel a short discussion. And uh, Irina, you get the, the 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 honor, the pleasure as Group A of uh, of uh, asking your group uh, the first question. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm Irina Verona with Veronica Pittsburgh, and I really enjoyed being part of this program, and in particular working. Martha, Violetta, Petra, C, Neha, and Brian. So um, here's my question for my group. In your video, the materials are the protagonists. In their life and their afterlife, a term which we discussed a lot, they work across time and scale and they create new connections. So as architects, as students, or teachers, what actions can you take move the needle closer towards this imagined scenario. I think Brian's gonna answer that or Martha. Um, I think just like um, collectively our group, um, we think as future architects, we can work from a hyper awareness of materiality. Um, what is available in the given area and climate. Um, and so there could be a shared da database of what could be used to inform what natural and man-made materials are available in like the region. Rather than thinking globally and what can be shipped from across the globe, um, we can shift our thinking from global to the local materials and climate and community. Um, you know, they say it's great power of the stamp comes great responsibility and I think we can be more mindful of the sustainability when um, our generation has the stamp in our hand. And we can help generate a new respect for existing buildings and think of creative ways to uplift and reimagine them rather than starting from scratch. So we can encourage clients to see the value and the potential of what they already have. Uh, so there's a lot for our generation to think about, reimagine. So Eric, do you want to build upon that with group B? Well, I have a, a maybe a little different question actually. Um, you know, uh, just first of all, hello, Rebecca, Max, um, Minelli, Audrey, and, and Man 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 Mariela. It's just been fantastic working with y'all, Marlena. So I guess climate divides us mostly, right? There are great inequalities, migration and so on. But in some cases, uh, crises have the paradox that they bring us together, as in this case, you all chose climate change and I chose that group. Um, how has this experience changed the way you feel about the, the architects or your role um, in terms of thinking about the problems, the agency, and the opportunities that climate change might, might uh, give you? Have you chosen who's answering? <laughs> I would say that um, the project has did exactly what I thought it would do or what was intended in the sense that it made me more aware and it made me a lot more sensitive to what's like what what we're doing. So like we talked about how a change of 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit or around three degrees. Um, three degrees doesn't really mean that much to me, but now like after like working on the project, it means a lot more than it used to. And I have a lot of ways to like, oh, okay. Um, that's how I feel about it. Great. Um, Alex and Group C. Hi, um, Michelle, Jean, and Sertelma. We had a great time together. Um, we had a really small group and we had really big ideas. Um, and so I'm, my question for you is if we had one more session together, uh, to continue this work, what would your next step be? 
Um, we had talked amongst ourselves a lot about the idea of developing some sort of a quiz for how all of the crises that we profiled are interrelated and specifically related to the housing crisis. Um, so in that sense, I think if we had one more session, it would be a really great tool, not just to look at what are the problems that we're facing, what are potential solutions, but to really start to have a tool where we can all turn the mirror on ourselves and say, okay, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And where can you start to improve to address things that are interconnected in an interconnected way? And uh, Sanjeev with Group, group D. Right. Um, I also am um, very grateful to be able to uh, spend some time with this group. Um, so my question for the group is, uh, our conversation included discussions about defining community and establishing trust as a result of an architectural education. There is a proposed architect's oath, which includes pledges to refuse work that violates human rights, promotes tyrants, and restore nature from humanity's damage. Does this, does this pledge reinforce or break through a privilege which surrounds an architect's education? Maybe I'll start with Sean. I'll call out with Sean. We have a shy group. Um, so I, I think it's a start. Um, I think taking a a, uh, an oath will start to build that relationship of trust between the general public and architects that I think has been lost. Um, and it, it will start to give the general public an idea of that, of that architects are there to work for the public good. So I think it's a start in the right direction. And moving things along, which is my role here, uh, <laughs> group uh, group E, Troy and, and Rosalind. Uh, okay, I drew the straw for the question, um, <laughs> so I'm gonna jump in. Uh, yeah, so yeah, thanks to my group, Rachel, Juntao, Morgan, Angel, Daniel, and Zai. Um, we had a great set of conversations. And as you saw in the video, um, and you all produced in the video, the conversations really looked at um, the limits or our, our kind of constructed limits of architectural education and tried to imagine a kind of rebalancing of that spectrum between the kind of rarefied role of the architect and the kind of more, um, uh, you know, widely um, culturally embracive and community embracive kind of role of um, uh, a citizen um, and through moments of play and otherwise. Um, and one thing we talked about was whether or not um, our question was kind of like uh, easy to ask and hard to answer. I'm curious in the kind of answers we formulated which one of the, the solutions you all think might be the easiest to achieve in a kind of action and maybe which ones would be the most difficult? I'm not gonna call on anybody, but we were talkers, I thought. Uh, personally, I think the, uh, obviously we're, we're meeting together online or in that, that platform. Um, creating that or, or widening that diversity or, you know, to ex or get our college experience or to get other things, I think is going to be one of the easiest things to do or creating that virtual reality online are, are some of the easier things. But uh, the hardest one I feel is probably going to be changing our system. I think we talked about, or changing our education, talked about uh, using the design process in the school and working hand on hand with people outside of school but I feel like that's probably one of the hardest things is to actually change what we are teaching in the school at the moment versus what we are um, trying to do. It should be, it should be stated that, that all of these videos will be, um, be online. Um, and this is really just kind of scratching the surface of the dialogue that could unfold from them. Um, but in, uh, in light of time, what, uh, we're gonna move on to the next five videos and keep this, keep this moving forward.
I would love to see urban cafes in my neighborhood. We need safe spaces to address the systemic racism, the social injustices, and find a way to unlearn whiteness, unlearn stereotypes, and find a way to move forward. Otherwise, we'll be stuck in this place and there will be no peace. There is a very much disconnect for between the built moderators and us community members. I feel like they just don't really listen to us in a way. They propose what they seem is adequate solution for our needs. I have lived in Harlem for 15 years and since the implementation of the urban cafes, community members are not afraid to speak to developers or government agents anymore. The urban cafe actually provided my grandma with a mental health worker to help her cope with the transition of the forced relocation. Urban cafes are a good idea, especially for my students. I feel like they could really benefit from attending these workshops and getting to interact with community members, getting that experience that you don't really get in school. As a built environment moderator, I've been applying almost all of my knowledge in community building and also I've been learning a lot from the community themselves. Absolutely, there definitely needs to be more involvement from the professors and the academics. We work with them every day while we do our data collection, our research and our analysis. And we have seen that they do not have the bias that politicians and other wealthy people who influence these kind of neighborhoods have. I kept pushing for a residential tower in Flatbush, Brooklyn, but I got a lot of pushback from the community. Until I went to one of the urban cafes, we were able to join a conversation with the built environment moderator and the project just broke ground. We've been approached by the urban cafe to put the line extension on hold because they say it jeopardizes the local businesses of Little Jamaica, so... In my honest opinion, I, I feel like there is really no gap between community members and professionals. I feel like there is interaction within both and there's stuff that gets built for communities, by communities. The urban cafe sounds like a very good idea because we need a sort of safe space for communities to speak about the social injustices and the climate crisis that is ongoing and is affecting these neighborhoods. The city planning office would come and attend a workshop or even teach a workshop and share the kind of outreach projects we do with the community boards. It has been very easy to communicate with the community members of the Lower East Side to develop their waterfront and protect their community gardens. We just signed a new regulation uh, to create after our children activities for them to exercise. When asked to reimagine in a three minute presentation our role as designers and thinkers trained to understand space, we quickly reached the limitations of the architect in their current position. The built environment is shaped more strongly by policy, financial structures, and surplus land value assessments than by the pen, or more accurately, mouse, of the architect. While the architect applies their design thinking to the brief as given, no real change can be made without challenging those parameters, which can be held responsible for structural issues in relation to environmental and social justice. Architects trained in spatial thinking remain excluded from spaces which determine these structures. There is a tendency in the discipline to view a project as a hermetic object, isolated in its own gravity and timeline, devoured singularly by private capital. It is only in hindsight when rising rent pushes marginalized communities further to the margins and climate change threatens to displace millions, that we understand the aggregate contribution the discipline has made, complicit in the pathology of the very spaces we sought to revolutionize. If architects have any ambition of making a difference, they cannot do so at the end of the process. The architect must insert themselves as a political actor earlier in the timeline. Rather than continuing to wrap optimized plans in ever more performative facades, architects must push up against the structures which are determining the ideal FAR. 
We have graduated with training in spatial thinking and design-based problem solving, but are presented a collapsing job market asking for Revit experience. And so we must look elsewhere for spaces which could benefit from architects and their ability to reimagine and restructure systems which no longer perform. The architect reclaiming agency is central to projects which seek to disrupt the exploitative growth model of contemporary cities and profit motives of the market. Jack Self writes, quote, I'm profoundly skeptical of anyone with such limited vision as to think grassroots, community, or crowdsourced design could be agents for meaningful social change in the face of such a venerable, hyper-stable opponent. Architecture must simply exploit or redeploy pre-existing financial conditions for social ends. The only indisputable requirement, of course, is that this architecture, which is capable of restructuring power relations, must be financially profitable." End quote. This is an architect who refutes their position at the end of the process, and instead forces their relevance in restructuring the processes which typically precede the architect's commission. Similarly, efforts to rethink the very structures of our discipline itself, our own pedagogies, institutions, precedents, codes, canons, and conventions, can act as agents in the restructuring of the systems that precede architectural commission. Which spaces would benefit from having an architect at the table? What makes an architect different from a politician, a developer, or a bank? Who does the architect serve? How do we reform the current model of practice as a labor service profession that responds primarily to private capital? Confronting these challenges will require engagement with efforts to dismantle the material and ideological systems driving today's social economic disparities. Thank you.
Welcome to the kickoff meeting for the New York Affordable Housing Competition Project. Congratulations, team. It is important that we are not only the architects of the project, but also hold other responsibilities. So let's get right in and talk business. Sophie, how are you thinking about this in terms of hiring? With our new 30-hour work week, it looks like we have the capacity to bring on three new people with the team. This cycle, we will start with our application process and we'll be bringing on people to be compensated for emotional, creative, and managerial labor. The application will include past experiences, a personal statement, portfolio growth, and an optional skill share, and will be posted on our community partners and diverse job boards. Our new hires will have an onboarding process, a shadowing period, and then we will come together for a community workshop to update our office values. Steven, does this fit into our financial policies? Yes, I'm working on a checklist for the financial policies we want to stick to. They are ensuring that all parties and stakeholders are properly compensated for their time and effort, transparency of how and where projects is funded, performers will be evaluated through an equity policy, have sensibilities towards the general budget, we make sure that not to utilize all the designated budget and ensure that the project has a determined excess funding in case of issues that arise. Also, how physically the sustainable is a project. I will not rely on private investment, ensuring that the project does not apply economic risk to parties and stakeholders. Jacob, what do you think about the existing site and how can we meet the city's project goals? Due to its long-standing history as a part of the urban fabric of New York City, both as public housing and its designation as a National Historic Landmark, I would say our first step should be to do an in-depth analysis of the buildings on the site, spatially, structurally, and within the community. The main issues here are resident displacement, gentrification, and community engagement in relation to the outdoor openly accessible public space. We need to hold meetings and understand from current residents and neighbors their take on the redevelopment of this site. Once we have all of this data and information, we can make a case to the city against the total demolition of the existing buildings, while also highlighting how we are still meeting their vision objectives for the site. This decision will also affect the material innovation and procurement. Any thoughts on this, Masa? Uh, yes, we will take our team to do a full analysis of the existing conditions and available materials so we get a sense of how much we want to demolish, renovate, and salvage. I'll also call local demolition companies and contractors to see if they have any leftover materials we can use. As usual, we should allocate as much time necessary for this research in the early stages of the project. In the meantime, we will look at some of our reversible assembly details and select the ones we think fit our proposal and budget. Once all that is done, we will put together the material passports with instructions and liability schedules to ensure our building materials are reusable. Also, we need to have a strong plan for quality control. Emma, how do you plan to, uh, to keep the process as transparent as possible? So we'll have an honest and extensive research during the design phase of the estimated amount of embodied characters like energy, carbon, and labor, making sure that our firm standards of embodiment levels cannot be passed. Um, and this transparency will extend not just to the client, but also to the building tenants as they use the building. And this will be through the building passport so that the greater amount of information will be provided to all parties involved. As the design team, we'll work with the contractors to make, create the best platform for this. And finally, after the build project is complete, our team will continue to research as the building's lifespan increases and involves. Abarami, how does the communications team plan to work with the rest of the teams in order to make sure that their ideas are transparent? I'm thinking of the workflow in two phases. In the first phase, we would create an internal manifesto to set an organizational structure for the entire project. This could then be used in RFP stages for different consultants so that we can work with people who are aligned with our thoughts and ideas. In the second phase, we work on public programming for the community residents and the different stakeholders to work with our different teams in the process of reimagining what if affordable housing can become in the climate of the overlapping crisis of public health inequality and racism. Looks like we have a lot to do. Let's go get to it. Oh, then I could draw. That was so we okay. Oh, so oh, I stayed, off. even though I'm in the top. I think then I turned it off. I stayed there. But you're, it switched on you because I've done that in other Zoom meetings. It didn't Maybe switch on. It didn't switch on mine. Everybody's still in the exact same spot. I know we the camera. Uh, when you turn your camera yeah. off, your glasses like to the bottom. Oh, yeah. Oh, let me try that. You dropped. <laughs> 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 well, you turned on the bottom already, so it didn't reshuffle yeah. anything. Like, if, if the videos aren't all, if 
the clips that we're showing aren't all the same length, then we start to have like a bleed over in between the sound. And from a, a, a video zoom to zoom itself, uh, let's have uh, groups F, G, H, I, and J have their uh, their um, their video on, and we'll start with uh, uh, group F, Anya, with the first question. It was such a pleasure to work with this group. Congratulations, Nina, Steve, Afnan, and Alejandra. You really. Um, got together, hashed it out, and um, fully frontally engaged this idea that architecture requires um, a large degree of empathy as a mode of interaction with, broader, uh, stake with a broader base of stakeholders. I'm wondering if this instigation to create more empathy between uh, architects, the academy, um, different users, in our profession, are you commenting on the conventions that we typically use in communication and architecture? Are you suggesting new modes of engagement? Are you weighing in on novel ways of addressing representation? Should I call, call someone out? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. About Nina. I just knew it. <laughs> anyway, um, I definitely think that in order for architects and basically we were saying built environment professionals because it's not only architects who design, we have to engage other professionals and me being also an architect and an urban designer, we have to consider how it is. We need to flip this top down approach. We need to flip it on its head and start getting into the communities and actually speak to them and find out what it is they actually want. And sometimes I know we're very imposing as architects and we always believe that we know what's best for these people and neighborhoods that are underdeserved. And my belief is that we definitely need to change the whole type of education and type of community engagement and try to get into the 
communities. Thank you. Uh, Nairon from Group G, do you want to pose a question? I do. Um, thank you so much uh, uh, to my group. I think we had really good discussions and I really enjoyed being, being with you for the past couple of weeks. Um, I, I think I'm interested to know more about the idea of optimism or the word optimism from your part that um, where does it exist for you and for the critique and the basically assessment that you beautifully provided? Where are you the most most optimist uh, in your, let's say, standing right now as a, you know, a recent graduate? Uh, what are you most optimistic about, uh, about the discipline right now? So, uh, I yeah. can't pose names, um, but yeah. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we've nominated a tribute. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, I think it's a good question and I, it's not the first time you've raised it as we were all doom and gloom in the prospects of what we were facing as freshly graduated architects. I think for me personally, the biggest source of optimism is that it all seems to be crumbling down in a sense. And so uh, I have full faith that things will look incredibly different in a very short amount of time. And so while it's uh, daunting and quite scary not to know what that different will look like, there is plenty of room for rupture and for change. And so that's what gives me optimism and drives me to pursue those questions. Thank you. Uh, we need as much optimism as possible. Um, Mark uh, with Group H. Thank you. Um, I just want to th really think it was really enjoyable uh, working with my team, Carmen, Blake, Akila, Ariel, Beatrix, uh, and Joey. Um, to my question, um, what you presented in our, and in our discussions uh, focused around a resistance to this en enclosure of, of privatization, right? Uh, that we were looking at a, a engagement through a cooperative model. So, you know, you gave one example in the video. I'm wondering, um, does that model scale? And also, um, we talked a little bit about strengthening the idea of practice and what does that require of the role of the architect? I think a little bit about moving forward or, or, or leadership. And I guess, um, Joey, you're going to answer that? Yeah, I think, um, I think it definitely does scale. Because um, ultimately what we're saying is that we should be the people initiating uh, the tools we have and the ideas we have. Uh, to derive agency, not wait around for a design to plop on the desk and work as a team to figure out something. Um, and it's so, like that's scalable because if we if we take over and we say like, yeah, we're going to use certain things about initiative or marketing or branding, and we're going to go out and redefine the architect as someone who gets the jobs, maybe works with communities to get what they need, work with other designers to maybe form a collaborative like what we want or what we want the design. Um, by exchanging like our private value to a much more collective value, we, we take that strength and we make it something that can be used in a, like a whole range of ways. Um, just by shifting our role to like people that can pose new ways. Um, and I think that's really what it's all about. That has no scale or limit. So Evie and, and Joffer uh, from Group I. Uh, I have also drawn the straw. Thanks, Troy. Um, first off, as, as everyone has, we just want to thank our group so much. It was a really fun few weeks. Um, Sophie, Jacob, Masa, Emma, Stephen, and Abirami. Um, one of the things that was so compelling, I think, to us was, uh, in fact, that each sort of member of our group was really different from all the others. And um, there was a kind of passion around those differences. And everyone kind of came to the table with, with really specific viewpoints. Um, but all sort of convening around the idea of how we can all be practicing better and sort of entering the world in a better way. And, and Evie and I, I think both learned a lot from them. Um, so my question to our group is just, <laughs> why was the office and the structure of the office and this kind of fictional office the right way to kind of test all of your diverse kind of viewpoints and why is that the best place to kind of commingle really divergent sensibilities uh, together? And I'm gonna direct it at our human resources manager, uh, Sophie, if you, could, if you could respond. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think over our conversations, like we really went through a lot, um, a lot of what we've seen of the topics. 
Um, but I think ultimately we were really concerned with the ethics of our future and just kind of understanding like what that could look like. Um, so we did an exercise where we actually just mapped out all of the potential trajectories of our lives um, through our careers. Um, and, and in doing that, I think we found um, the point of, of agency, a, a kind of a way into it was um, starting an office. I think a lot of us, you know, have dreams about it. And I think it's something within the architectural canon or understood within the architectural community um, as, as some form of independence. So we wanted to use that as kind of a way to um, really explore what it meant to, to think about these things ethically. Um, and I think something else that came out of our, our discussions and even just watching the video again um, is really the importance of, um, I call them like hyphen positions, but like the idea that we would be designers or architects and something else. And I think that that and um, will be really important in thinking about the impact um, that we'll have no matter what we do kind of moving forward. Um, so that acknowledgement. Thank you. Um, Miriam and Nathan of uh, Group J. Oh, Nathan, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm hearing you, so. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks, Paul. Sorry about that. And um, thanks to the group, um, Cheryl, Lauren, Seneca, Logan, you guys did great. And it was a lot of fun and super interesting for Miriam and I. Um, you guys did this amazing job of documenting these weird spaces and interventions that have sort of taken over the public and private realm for all of us in, in COVID world and COVID cities. Um, and the video kind of sort of documented these things and collected them. And it was interesting to see these resonances from different parts of the country showing up in your videos. Um, I think Cheryl's gonna answer. My question has to do with uh, trying to be projective about this and where you think there might be design opportunities in this, in this realm that's sort of emerged. Yeah, of course. It has been a pleasure to work with everyone. I think our video, our four squares, is essentially each of our views, Seneca, Logan, me, Lawrence, into COVID's effect on um, the blurring of the lines between public and private. Um, I feel like after COVID, um, being quarantined inside, windows and balconies have become our desperate view of the outdoors and the public streets from the private. And on the other hand, we have public spaces like Domino Park, where even though it's public, there's this desire to privatize it so we can socially distance from each other while socializing. And so I think from knowing the two spectrums, our title public-private spatial continuum is really exploring the opportunity to create adaptable, more adaptable realms of architecture um, by being able to adapt to different space and times like our current era. Thank you, thank you all. I, I feel like everything is just too short and we wanna have more discussion, but we um, let's let's keep going. We're gonna move on to the next set of, uh, of, uh, of five videos. Um, and uh, and continue the com well, conversation or question and answer. Um, so let's move on. What if, what if the framing question is just like, how are architects accountable a lot. So we kind of started by populating this theory bit with dominant accepted references at the time, being more autonomous or like being more engaged with certain issues. So is that we're kind of prioritizing certain voices, considering architecture and care together, the field needs to take major shifts. Uh, maybe we could like these, these uh, horizontal curves, we could intersect them in a Venn diagram. We were thinking about a kind of um, cyclical nature of things initially something new is about to happen let's reimagine what that is um, to show the di diversity of thought within this kind of block of the class of 2020 i feel like what we're saying is that the consequence of architecture is much more significant than the object of it 
And what I'm still missing is what we're trying to say by referencing all of these projects and sorting them. The fact that agency autonomy and accountability are changing over time vis-a-vis -vis the profession is already an argument in itself. The, the y-axis is from indifference to high or extreme level of care. I guess I'm just wondering what the broader question is. Are we saying like... I'm having a hard time with the three words. I love <laughs> words and sets of three. There's so many forms of agency that slip from professional practice to academia to being a citizen. And accountability, I guess, is a question of to whom, because everybody's accountable to somebody. It's kind of like you have the ability to do something. Well, but like maybe you have the agency to not care. No, because I think I think the indifferent people would be way over here. Are we caring more now about the architect themselves or how do we overlook, you know, the values that the, the, the person designing the architect themselves was perpetuating? Are we talking about the production of architecture or are we talking about the production of architects and the culture around it? Or are we talking about both? Is it about the shape of the building or the architects shaping the building? What does that what does that mean for accountability at that time? How did this, what did this make? What are we trying to say? Architects talking about architecture versus non-architects talking about architecture. Discourse and ideas of agency go through cycles and we're on the upswing of a new period of that. It's also a kind of optimistic because it has all these factors that we saw historically help move the profession forward. A bunch of radical practices are gonna start coming out. In a very real way, I think we just like, we kind of just need to like justify our employment. It's not necessarily challenging anything. We inherently have our own biases and if we were to just juxtapose that, that itself could create an argument is that I am going to be accountable for something. There is accountability at the end of the day and right now we need to choose. That moment and the curve is kind of an interesting one if looked uh, through the lens of, of an individual. You know, which, which way do you go? Uh, you know, in this diagram it is it is drawn a way to just exemplify, you know, that sort of two polar relationship. But it doesn't mean that in history it's necessary that polar all the time, right? Would, would, would you mind sending us um, the recording of yes. the Zoom call? Sure, yeah, not, sure, not a problem.
optimistic practice sees no end.
Common Plus is a network which allows boutique practices with differing specializations to collaborate in order to take on larger, more complex projects, and operate with greater stability. Right now, small innovative firms exist in isolation and competition with each other, and are limited in the scale of projects they take on. Inspired by the model of the Architecture Lobby's cooperative network, we propose our own cooperative that creates a formal structure for collaboration and the scaling up of innovative practices. Hey everyone, I'm Marvell. I'm a member of the Marketing and Design Solution Studio of Common Plus. I have an interest in graphic novels, fashion, furniture, and product design. Furthermore, I use my interest to influence and assist many design decisions for clients. Currently, I am collaborating with an animation studio in Japan to discuss how architects and graphic artists can coexist in the same industry and help solve their working conditions. All in all, Common Plus provides opportunity for many to experiment and explore innovative possibilities, motivating me every day. I'm Catherine, and I just joined a material, environmental, and system thinking group at Common Plus. Um, prior to joining Common Plus, I have, jo I have worked in Indonesia, the US, Chile, Puerto Rico, Mexico, and Jordan. Together with Megan, I'm currently hosting a workshop on variable density material that looks into the graffiti and center of mass and how it affects the geometry of architectural elements to reduce the amount of material used. We're scaling up the prototype for the lab construction and suggest an update on a new building code based on this research. Thanks everyone. Hello, I'm Megan. I'm mostly a scholar, partly an artist and architect, and very much a believer in discipline creative practice. So I uh, teach and write and consult and I'm honored to lead the research and academic sector of Common Plus, where I contribute in terms of guiding ethical design practices, especially those involving regional and cultural issues. And currently I'm collaborating with Marvell and the graphics team in producing an educational TV series called The Shape of Gravity that talks about where physics and form intersect in both the built and natural environment. And Catherine is also on board uh, with her materials team in producing a prototype for it. So lots of interesting stuff. I'm Daham. I'm a member of the service design studio of Common Plus. Prior to this, I ran a small solo practice and was an adjunct professor. Right now I'm working with our academic department to hold a series of public workshops, as well as initiating a project to pilot programs on circular economies with our material department. I enjoy these sorts of collaborations which I was never really able to do while working for my own practice and the skills I'm learning from my peers. Common Plus empowers small practices to take on a greater scope and scale of projects while maintaining the autonomy needed for creativity, originality, and experimentation. Common Plus is a response to the precarity and marginalization of small boutique practices today. We assert that via specialization and collaboration, we can leverage our individual abilities to bring progressive architecture to more communities. Okay, let's uh, uh, move to KLMNO uh, with the videos on, and we'll start with uh, Leslie and Sasa with uh, their question. Um, thank you, Paul, and thank you, Daniela, Gwen, Isabella, uh, Jonathan, Nika, and Will for three weeks of engaging and very thought-provoking conversations. Um, I think we evidently had very lively discussions as seen in the video. Um, so you presented the three A's, uh, agency, autonomy, accountability as diverse and sometimes opposing posts. Where do you see the synergies between the three A's? Again, agency, autonomy, and accountability. Is there anyone accountable for this question? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I had to. <laughs> Jonathan and I were going to double. It was too easy. We were going to double on it. Uh, yeah, at least I think uh, we started talking about accountability as a way to kind of move back and forth between um, the idea of being exter externally having agency and then also internally focusing um, on autonomous projects and accountability is kind of again about like who, who are you focusing towards um, with your work. I think also in the video you can see our kind of 
list of references uh, were never clearly one or the other. Um, we kind of had trouble putting them in certain buckets. It was all kind of overlap. All right, um, Brant and Jerome. Hello, uh, Jerome and I really uh, enjoyed our conversations with the group as well. Um, and our group was one of the very few that didn't have any images of their faces. So I wanted to just quickly for a second, put them here. So thank you, Lini, Jaya, Lucy, Jack, Sean, and Vivian. And our question is, in our weekly workshops, we discuss slowness and the current state of our everyday environments, um, as well as predicaments. And it seems that the world and architecture is in a very specific time. Being recent graduates and taking the time to look around and document, can you give a few examples how this specific time has surprised and or challenged you? And I think it's Jack who answered. Yeah, I'll take this one after consulting with the group. Um, I think all of us were uh, really surprised by the speed of our lives that have gone on since graduating. Um, I think we expected the speed of school to be translated into the speed of work. And instead we are frozen in different ways and doing unexpected things. We are working jobs that are unexpected or not planned for. We're living in cities and in situations that we didn't anticipate. And so as a result, um, in the video, we kind of chose to uh, look really closely at where we are and understand uh, how we're seeing things uh, together in terms of the call and response videos that you saw on the screen. And I think um, we were really challenged uh, individually to learn to be uh, still, to be present and to be flexible as people. Um, and so this is speaking for the group, really a time uh, where we've been like reflective, uh, we're anticipating motion in the future, um, but we're also uh, learning to take care of ourselves, um, knowing that that will lead to um, what will come next and the work that will come next. Thank you. Um, Lapchi and Allison. Great. Um, we definitely want to say thank you to our group. We loved our conversations from the last three weeks, Alex, Annie, Jamie, John, Gabby, and Tommy. Uh, we really appreciate the refreshing and unexpected ideal of defiant optimism. And we see your manifesto as a role model pursuit for the practice of architecture. And we want to see this continue and have impact. So our question for you is, what do you see our next steps in disseminating or sharing defiant optimism to your fellow graduates and to the profession and to the professionals in the discipline at large? Um, I'll go ahead and jump in and we all have, I think, different takes on that. But um, I think one thing that we talked about a lot was just our desire for this to become something that continues to be built upon by an audience larger than ourselves. So we are addressing our fellow 2020 graduates and are very interested in the continued development of this through the rituals, through further editing of the points and really see this as a document that could just change over time. Thank you. So move to Sunil. So. Thanks, Paul. Um, uh, thank you, James, Nadine, Benjamin, Christopher, and Matthew. Um, it was a really powerful final results. And what I thought was so interesting was how the five of you came with these very strong, different voices and kind of overlapping interests. And that in the final video, there was silence. So I was wondering if one of you might talk about the power of silence in the video, but also as an architect, how can silence be a powerful tool? Um, yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think 
as in, in the video, in, in a certain sense, I think it connects to what you're talking about, that we all came in with um, very distinct sort of viewpoints. I think there was a lot of overlap and in, interrelation with our perspectives, which made the conversations interesting, but we also all had kind of our, our distinct focuses. And I think um, one of the things we talked about a lot in constructing the video was trying to connect all of our different ideas and different sort of questions about what architecture and more specifically what architects can be doing or can become. And um, we really became more interested in kind of probing that series of questions rather than um, sort of defining a specific answer. And so I think there's a, there's a bit of an idea there where um, it wasn't about sort of declaring something um, very boldly, but more about, um, I think sort of deconstructing a little bit and asking some of those questions. I think maybe connecting more to the larger uh, kind of narrative that you're talking about, the larger idea. Um, I think there's a lot of sort of complicit silence in the architecture practice today. And that was something that we also talked about a lot was that architects do have a lot of power, but they're also very much um, trapped within the larger sort of systems of, of global capitalism, of the way that the profession is run, the way that the pedagogy operates and all these other kind of larger challenges. And so um, there's a, an element there where architects, I think, have to start uh, imagining where their voice fits in um, and how they can sort of take agency and take control in certain areas, but how they're also sort of uh, trapped within those larger structural systems as well. Thank you. And I, I get to, to ask a question for Group O. And in case you can't recognize the Group O, they're all behind sunglasses right now. So, um, and uh, 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 Marvell, Daham, Catherine, and Megan, um, I, who didn't know each other before this. In fact, no, none of the groups, to my knowledge, uh, knew each other. Um, and you, you were able to form a collective in the future, common, uh, common uh, plus. And uh, I, one of the things I think is super interesting is that in order to maintain a kind of uh, autonomy or specialization, but still have agency, you argue that in fact, this group can be, can be large, you know, can be big to gather. Um, so it's actually the size that enables the individual freedom and the specialization. So, which leads to my um, pretty straightforward que uh, question, which is, how big can you be and still be effective? How big would Common Plus be able to get? And in the act of acquiring all these specializations, are there projects that you would not want or you would turn down? And I'm not sure which one of you had said you were gonna respond. And I can direct it to Megan. All right. So um, thank you, Paul, for asking. I think the the major um, point of consideration for us is to find or attempt to find a balance between the small boutique practice and the strength advantages that it affords versus the bigger corporate model and the stability and efficiency that makes it successful in, in the environment of today. Um, economic as well as um, political, as well as this uh, global. So I think we were interested in really looking for a practical solution to maximize an individual architect's agency um, by basically sharing common costs um, to, to um, achieve stability um, and efficiency, but still maintain individual creative freedom and flexibility. And in that sense, uh, with regard to your question about how big it can get, I think, I think if I were to see it as an optimization function, <laughs> then the sweet spot would lie somewhere between a, um, like the parameters that would come into play would be the shared administrative cost and business, business cost versus the increasing marginal expense that will accrue as more people start to collaborate with less efficiency. I think that is also a problem that um, bigger corporates probably come to experience. So if I were really answering that question, that would be the kind of parametric model I would build. 
of course, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> All right, very, very fair. So, um, so why don't we, we move on to the last group? And I know that the first part of this video involves a voiceover that's going to be done. Um, so just wanted to make sure that group P, uh, the next group, group P is ready for that because the video will start relatively, ready relatively to quickly. All right, yes, sir. fantastic. All right, let's get going then. All right, over the past three weeks, our group focused on identifying neutral paved spaces in cities that could be adapted for new purposes in the wake of the pandemic. In the following slides, we generated a series of what if scenarios questioning how these seemingly neutral paved spaces could become flexible hubs for socially distant communal activities, specifically spaces for public transit, streetscapes, and parking lots. Firstly, what if empty parking lots and transit stops along University Ave in St. Paul could be adapted and reprogrammed for better heating, shelter, and lighting as passengers wait for the light rail in often frigid temperatures. People need to spend time at the stations, even when it gets cold, to use the transit services. Uh, so in this scenario, many parking lots uh, alongside stations are underused and some take on alternative uses such as farmers markets on weekends. Some light rail shelters include heat lamps um, and electric mats provide a short-term option while geothermal systems provide a long-term option, storing heat and warming water in tubes below the pavement. Flexible solar-powered heat ca canopies can be added to existing shelters or integrated into new, more permanent structures along with modular furniture. Second, what if freeway underpasses in Miami, Florida could be reactivated to embrace more pedestrian-friendly traffic and socially distant community interaction through the installation of open air markets, galleries for mural artists, modular seating and park equipment, an outdoor theater, or even a COVID testing site. So the following scenarios spell out different ways in which these underpasses are reactivated uh, for the various uses that have been observed in, in Miami at this time. Third, how have streets become extensions of our domestic spaces? How have streetscapes embraced the concept of warmth and neighborly principles while maintaining levels of social distancing? We dive into the city of Monterrey, Mexico to analyze communities that are con constantly readapting their housing through the local concept of autoconstrucción and how this could be translated elsewhere. Next, we look at new normal streets. What if streetscapes and parking lots could merge and adapt during different times of the week? Zooming into 5th and 46th in Long Island City, how are we noticing potentials for multifunctional social and workspaces? Currently a parking lot in a mixed use district, how could this site become an outdoor workspace during weekdays and transition into social space on weekends? What about parking lots in suburban communities? Taking a closer look at the community of Woodbury, New York, parking lots located in local strip malls have become hotbeds for new uses during the pandemic. We question how this seemingly unused real estate can be repurposed to promote physical, emotional, and social well being through simple changes in layout and function. And finally, what if we take a nostalgic look at American entertainment, specifically by re examining the history of the American and Drive in Theater? to generate new scenarios for socially distant cultural gatherings that embrace the use of the car. The following analysis captures a variety of newfound uses for surface parking as sites for cultural events in Atlanta, a city plagued with overly abundant surface parking in its downtown region. The following proposal traces the evolution of the drive-in offering suggested layouts for various forms of car-centric entertainment in a downtown Atlanta surface parking lot, from a drive-in theater to a worship space a uh, concert venue or drive through art gallery. And in conclusion, we hope that these case studies offer a glimpse at the plethora of design opportunities surrounding paved urban spaces in response to COVID-19. We're here to discuss public space. Before jumping into it, let's attempt to understand what constitutes a public space. What does a public space look like? Or what can it do? 
In 2020, our perception and use of public space has become increasingly diverse and dynamic. Let's take an example of a park surrounded by streets on all sides. This park is programmed into various components and we have activities taking place on it. But do we just restrict this space to a kit of parts, a definition of what it's meant to be? Or can we question it? Can we shout in this space? Or can we eat here? Can we perform or read or protest or feel safe? Maybe these are a bunch of elements we know but take for granted when we design a public space. Aren't these spaces also shaped by external societal disruptions like climate change or COVID-19? 2020 has been an effective tool in unveiling the multi-layered, dynamic, and temporal nature of a public space. It has also made us understand the need for such spaces more than ever, and the fact that we as designers realistically only withhold a certain level of control on these spaces. Now let's take designer Sophia here, who is set to design a public space. Hey Sophia, can you help me create this public space? But wait a minute, don't you think the space will change regardless of my intervention? How will I control that? Well, maybe it's not about controlling. I guess, and maybe it's time I relinquish control and embrace the fact that things will change. So now what? How do we as designers respond to this condition? Well, to start, let's ask a question of what if. What if we use empathy as our primary guiding principle? What if we base public space programs on local community needs, rather than standardized solutions that really don't cater to diverse communities? What if we listen and then engage with the community, rather than asserting our knowledge and assuming we have all the answers? What if we accommodate specificity through flexibility and abandon the one-size-fits-all syndrome? What if we question the policies made by decision makers to broaden the scope of service to the community? And finally, what if we engage with the present in order to anticipate the next step, to progress, to move forward? What if we reimagine the role of designers in society and our ability to shape public spaces? But. Before we reimagine, maybe let's first just imagine what we haven't yet. Okay, so now it's recording. Completely empty city with only buildings and the city itself. Um, kind of my observation of this true void, a, a true urban void, that is a term that we often use in architecture in a more or less a metaphorical way pre-pandemic, but now we actually seeing- And do you think it makes you feel closer to the other public? Like as you're walking around, do you feel a new, any new affinity because they're also wearing a mask? It becomes a new unit, um, a new measurement for everything. The, the barrier can be a, a, a wall, a surface, a screen, a mask, and or a space. Very new. We're in a situation now where those barriers allow us to get as close to people as we possibly can. So the whole sense of boundary now is one of getting close. How close can you be to each what other? What are the scale? And it's still in the kind of progress of solidifying what are the scales of in between. It's all about boundaries such that you can pack them in and get close, right? And, and, and any urban realm is like that New York, you know, we're very close to our neighbors in New York, right? Because we have, you know, the, the construction of boundaries that, that allow for that. Now we're starting to, you know, bring new boundaries, the circles in the park, the marks on the ground, the mask. And that, that, that makes us feel more comfortable. Kind of repetition and what things get repeated in these different scales. Starting by covering our faces with masks and having a social distancing measurement of six feet. This repetition became the new norm. From the subway footprint markings to circles of nine feet in diameter, demarcating personal space in the public park, to even a greater extent of directed circulation in urban scale as a way to encourage us to reconnect and to protect ourselves. We are here to expand the conversation of challenging the repetition we have observed from the current design solutions. Design makes an impact in the lives of people of all ages and disabilities from the human scale to the urban planning perspective. 
Public health is a priority now and always. Design has a significant role to empower communities with choices about their health and well-being. With the spread of COVID-19, emerged various urban and social problems. Some of these included empty streets, struggling retail, and small businesses, and an overall decline of social, economic, and citizen well-being. As the designers of the urban environment, how do we respond to these challenges? How can we leverage this critical moment in time to reshape the urban fabric and foster community well-being? The pandemic has sparked many questions and a global discourse among industry professionals as well as young designers. It has presented the opportunity for a diverse group of aspiring designers to come together and converse about some pressing challenges that can transform the future of designing cities. Some of the urgent concerns that provoked our discussion included public and semi-public space, agency of design, equity, and flexibility of space. These issues are not mutually exclusive, rather should be framed in the context of one another to inspire a more holistic and resilient city development. How can semi-public space encourage safe social interactions? In our current urban realities, balconies, backyards, and sidewalks foster limited interactions. In the context of our discussion, we question the idea of semi-public space. This space can be understood as an intermediary realm that facilitates the sociability and connectivity of the public sphere and the safety of the private. What is problematic about, the current, about how we currently conceive of public space? Can semi-public space help with outbreaks and promote the physical and mental well-being of citizens? Can it create more spontaneous interactions? What if alleyways and thoroughfares can become a more stimulating sensory experience for surrounding residents? And what if balconies can become a more integral part of the household? Once a space is designed, what agency do designers have in determining the overall organization of the city? How could the coordination of different departments, agencies, and stakeholders lead to improved inclusivity? How can we engage communities in the decision-making process and empower them to take ownership of the project to foster a better community in the future? Different professionals could be coordinated to assist the community better. If the community is kept in mind when the agencies organize their plans, we believe that the end result would revolve much more around the locals' needs. Should architects design spaces that are more flexible or adaptable by the user? social equity be guaranteed within flexible and adaptable design? Can existing public spaces be adaptable and support multiple activities at different times? Crisis has always called for positive change, so can COVID-19 lead to more resilient, equitable, and citizen-led urban development? Reimagine. How can we as designers, planners, and architects help envision an inclusive and equitable future for streets and public spaces? How do we define building back better when a vast range of culture, people, and values exists across U.S. cities? New York City. The New York City subway's modification for coronavirus is not the most attention catching now. However, adding an attractive color-coded system that clearly shows people where to stand or avoid, and adding hand sanitizers and protective screens will help raise people's awareness of public safety. Little Italy. Vacant lots will be used for temporary programs like live performances in local markets. Dividers will be designed to incorporate outdoor seating that is accessible to all. Roads are already closing for pedestrians and bicycles, and this will expand and remain permanent to accommodate walking and resting under all weather conditions. Ann Arbor, Michigan. 
With car density decreasing due to coronavirus and businesses subsequently utilizing the streets to their advantage, the city implemented a Healthy Streets initiative. Cones were added to create a bike lane during the week, and on the weekends, the shutdown of some streets allowed the introduction of street art to bring back liveliness. Art, so often hidden in private galleries and movies which take place in ticketed theaters, can now be introduced to a broader public for their appreciation. The increased size of public spaces for pedestrians should be used to such an advantage. Birmingham, Alabama. Designers and cities can work together to create ample urban conditions for its citizens during the coronavirus pandemic by reimagining alleyways or sidewalks to create safe and open outdoor spaces. While the design interventions and distancing rules can only go so far in a city, it is up to individuals themselves to follow suit and make their neighborhoods as safe as possible. New Jersey Meadowlands. After the virus ends, millions will become used to and even prefer work from home. Employers downsize offices. Fewer people commute by car. Our now overbuilt highways and airports will be restored to nature. Now, thousands of vacant offices and buildings will be too expensive and energy inefficient. Abandoned towers, malls, airports, and arenas will become ruins, a modern acropolis. Instead of flying to Europe, eco-friendly tourists visit this new Museum to American Civilization. Demolished highways and buildings and flood zones will become landfill. The sedimentary layers in these landfill mountains will be a geological history of American civilization in the Anthropocene. As we reimagine the future of cities, we need to consider if these changes go far enough or if deeper structural changes are needed too. Who is included in this vision of the city? Who is left out of it? Okay, so uh, Nancy and Josh, you get to go first. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Anna, Christine, David, Davis, Isabella, and Molly. Uh, it was really wonderful getting to know all of you uh, these past couple of weeks. And our question is, uh, so public space has emerged as a safer setting for many indoor activities in some uh, instances, vehicular infrastructure has been deprioritized to make room for program spaces, while in other cases, cars effectively socially distance folks in need of critical services. Many of these solutions are practical retrofits, but how might they transform over time? In terms of the season, no changes slash challenges ahead, as well as the moment they final, we finally overcome the pandemic. What could remain and what might change? It seems that each of our interventions highlight an overabundance of paved spaces within a variety of urban environments we've considered, as well as a common distinction between paved space and pedestrianized space, shedding light on the false assumption that accessible space automatically implies occupiable and or accommodating space. The instances and design solutions addressed in our presentation begin to reframe the way in which one might reconsider the design of future paved spaces for increased flexibility moving forward, perhaps with the assumption that paved space itself should not necessarily be seen as permanent, but rather something that can be removed or recycled. If anything, the desires for flexible spaces spurred on by communal responses to the pandemic offer a catalyst for long-term reconsiderations of alternatives to paved infrastructure, whether by reimagining new surface materials or modular paving systems that can accommodate vehicular accessibility while being more easily removed, reconfigured, and repurposed over time. Our conversations also seem to stress that spaces for parking and paving are not mutually exclusive to spaces that can accommodate public gathering, but rather than deprioritizing vehicular accessible infrastructure, moving forward from this pandemic, we are reminded of the need for more hybrid models as a standard for outdoor public space accessible to both cars and pedestrian traffic. It's a good segue to Chris and, um, and your group. 
Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, I just want to reiterate, uh, as everyone else has, how much fun and how uh, energizing it was to have the chance to hang out with Rebecca and Clock uh, and Emma and Vasant over the last three weeks. Um, you know, usually, like everyone went into this tired, and I think when I left, the end of each of our conversations was just raring to go. So, um, thank you guys for letting me let me chat with you. Um, I want to ask a question that really is sort of how we ended our last conversation and it didn't necessarily come up in your video, but I think um, maybe was present as a kind of undertone. Um, and it's a word that we've heard a couple of times this evening, but the question that I have is what makes you all so optimistic about the, the newfound awareness and valuing of public space in the future of our cities and society? This idea of optimism seems to be coming through and, and it's what started as a kind of dark and, and sort of gloomy conversation really evolved over our three, our three weeks. So um, I think Vasanth was gonna take a stab at this, um, this question of optimism and the, and the role of public space and society going forward. Um, hi, Chris. Yeah, so first, like, uh, personally, I believe it's good to be optimistic, one. And the fact that you should, like, I mean, I just like the quote that you should, which we have been discussing for a while, that you should never let a crisis go to waste. So uh, this crisis, uh, we're not just, like, questioning the design profession or, like, we're trying to update something that's already there, but we're trying to uh, redefine certain terms as to what exactly is public or trying to question what constitutes public. So the pandemic has been pretty evident in establishing the underlying faults in the society or like the underlying issues the society faces and public real is as much as about the society and how it functions. Uh, so people are just becoming more aware of this. So the more aware the people are, the easier it is for us designers to engage with them. So we don't function with as much assumptions if people are more aware uh, and uh, we could try and like uh, engage with them much better and try and understand their needs in a better way. So. I believe that's like the, the way forward and which is why we're being a little more optimistic. Yeah, thank you. Um, John. Um, yeah, thank you, Paul. And thanks to the league for, for doing this. I, I just have to say before the question that this has been a remarkable version of a conversation in, in, in a way the the first time that it was incredibly palpable that the, 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 the production that we all just have been reviewing um, is somehow uh, feels still partly part of the conversation rather than a kind of deliverable in, in the most um, uh, kind of pleasurable sense that, that it isn't a kind of polished thing, that it is still very much feels like uh, something positive um, as a part of not to give a conversation closure um, and in that spirit, I, I had such a um, good time talking with Jeremy, Katie, Anne, and, and Ting um, as they worked through their ideas on uh, um, evaluating publicness given the pandemic. And one of the things that kept coming up, which you've probably heard in the video, um, was the degree to which boundaries that are often considered to be put in place to separate us, um, that one of your kind of findings was that the pandemic made you aware of how boundaries actually allow us to get together, to come together, to feel safer being closer, and that the public realm has changed and, and relies now on a new version of, of the boundary, right? And so I just wanna ask our group if you could speculate, not so much on what you just uh, shared, but speculate on what this might mean moving forward in the public realm the fact that certain kinds of boundaries introduced into the public realm actually allow us to either get closer or, or stay close. Yeah, thank you, John, for your question. It was great working with you and the rest of the group. And I, I think, yeah, that is a conversation we had for a while about this predicament of boundary of separation, but also um, boundary creating nearness of separation, but then also bringing people together. And, I think moving forward, um, we are seeing a different way of understanding urban density or public kind of activities in terms of you know density itself. And that's kind of also what we are addressing in our observation and in the video, like um, crowds of gatherings will no longer be what we imagined um, half a year ago of you know large crowds like um, tidy packed with each other, but more of you know smaller micro 
kind of gatherings or, you know, um, small groups, breakout rooms, even, you know, in a Zoom, we have breakout rooms and, you know, and that kind of um, energy that's going to move forward with smaller, more intimate and um, more intimate exchanges. I think that is really the direction that we can see. Thank you. Uh, Gabrielle and Athar. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Amber, Farida, Jonathan, Naomi, and Sushmita. It was really a pleasure to have these inspiring conversations with you. And we're looking forward also to your next steps and endeavors. So please keep in touch. Um, our question for you all is um, as follows. Architects have been traditionally preoccupied with designing buildings. Urbanization has been driven mainly by real estate developers and planning has been the domain of small governmental agencies. Yet you all are interested in working in ways that don't necessarily align with these three established means of transforming the environment. What do you think architects uh, might do to carve out new means of intervening in urban realities? Um, thank you for the question. I think I'll, I'll take the question on behalf of the group. Um, as we discussed, I think what the pandemic really brought to light is not only the fragility of the governance, but also the lack of coordination between various agencies and departments and the resilience between uh, various communities. Uh, so like what we discussed, we said as architects and designers, we're kind of second responders to a crisis. Like we kind of help communities imagine what cities can be after crisis or work with the aftermath of a crisis. So I think it's important for um, architects agencies to kind of coordinate and not look at architecture as a standalone uh, profession or like a standalone building. Um, also to kind of respect the context and kind of engage more with the neighbors and context and um, various agencies. Um, and also I think it's important to give community the leverage to take ownership of the projects um, so that they kind of own it and in a long term you know, they are maintaining it and um, they kind of you can use it for like multiplicity of activities and uses. Yeah, so I think the coordination is so important and critical. Thank you. And, and, and Julio, you get to be our, our last question of the evening. Except you have to be off mute. So. It in time again. Uh, thank you to the league for making this um, um, amazing uh, space to uh, share and to learn from our 2020 class. Uh, thank you, Tal, Tiffany, Hayden, Miles, and Natsume. It's been a real pleasure. Um, you discussed a lot of the structural inequalities brought forth by people and capital flows and their resultant infrastructures and territories. Can you foresee a way to co-op flows as equalizers? Um, <laughs> oh. I think okay. it's, it's a great question. It's a challenging question. I think it's really a challenging question because um, I would look to the future and think about the effects of climate change. Um, there will be definitely more climate migrates in the future, um, you know, as temperate zones shift north or south. And I think that really challenges us as architects to think about ways that cities can adapt to that pretty massive Change in, pop, change, change in population and also flows within the city of people being able to get to work more easily in the future. Um, and I think particularly now more than ever, it's important for us to see um, cities as part of the solution to coronavirus. And I think that's a very difficult thing to do because in this time, it's so easy to think of suburbs as, as the solution or cars or more public private transportation as being ways to avoid getting in sick. And I think really historically, we've seen that cities are at the densest accumulation of people the most uh, efficient use of resources, the place where people can live and consume the, 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 le the, the fewest amount of resources, um, the, le the least amount of commuting time to work. And so I think in the future, to increase what you're calling flows here, I think we really need to reinvest in cities. And that means reinvesting in public transit, which is particularly difficult in this time of coronavirus when we're all thinking about ourselves as individuals in our own homes, in our own cars. Um, I think secondly, this also requires us to reinvest in affordable housing and public housing. Um, and that's very difficult because we've lived in a society where we as architects kind of rely on the market, on market forces to produce housing and not so much on government or on the public to create these kinds of spaces. So it's about increasing government investment in the commons and housing, 
in safer streets and green infrastructure and public parks. Um, but I think more importantly, in the bigger picture, um, I think when I think about increasing flows and by that I think of a creating a more equal city, I think about the need for larger structural change. Um, and I think that that larger structural change requires government investment in the commons. Um, it requires government investment in better zoning to create streets and to create neighborhoods that have more mixed incomes. Because I think as we've really seen from the past, these kinds of mixed neighborhood incomes, these kind of mixed diversity incomes, uh, places where uh, it's not segregated by income as large, large parts of America are, these kinds of communities are best adapted for I think a very diverse world, they're best adapted for um, a future that is more equal, that is more democratic, that is no longer as segregated as many of our American cities are. So as I look toward the future, as I think about increasing flows, I think it requires this combination of small interventions in the urban landscape and streetscapes and individual buildings and housing and work of architects, but it also requires larger changes about how we think about the role of government in creating um, the kind of society we want. And that means government legislation and a greater sense of the commons and the collective and public health care and all of that. Um, and on that note, I think it's good that we all, it's, it's, it's time for us to all go out and vote. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well said, well said. So look, I wanna, uh, speaking of voting, um, there is a debate. And uh, so I wanna, I wanna offer a toast, um, uh, a kind of toast to the empathy and optimism in these videos. It's a fantastic collection of ideas and prov provocations. Uh, which in a sense will, will be a catalyst for uh, what happens next. This was meant as an experiment. Um, and whether that's formally through the league, I mean, the website is in process, next steps are being formatted. We need your input, all of your input on what, we, what, uh, what the next step should be. Uh, it certainly requires a longer discussion than the time we had tonight. Um, and hopefully it also is a catalyst for informal discussions that continue among yourselves. Um, you provided us a lot to think about and hopefully this platform has connected uh, you to each other and in that process elevated your ideas and your, your optimism. We, we need your optimism, we need your empathy as there is an almost insurmountable amount of work to be done. So to be continued, uh, thank you, stay connected and, and cheers. Um, and again, I'll double down on the thank you for an amazing collection of conversations uh, and the event tonight. So 